Recording. Welcome everybody. We'll just give a couple more seconds to let everybody come in. I see the number of participants are increasing. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's kick off. Welcome to this Nutrition for Growth Summit side event. My name is Emma Coles. I worked for many years in the food industry, uh, but for the last four years have been focused on public health and in particular on lifestyle interventions for people with chronic diseases such as type 2 diabetes and arthritis. I work on the Dutch Reverse Diabetes 2 Now program where we have helped over 3,000 people reverse or manage their type 2 diabetes, which means that I see every day both the impact of unhealthy lifestyle, but also what can be achieved with a shift to a healthier diet. Today, we're going to be hearing about the Please Please program from the UK-based Food Foundation. Uh, this program is focused on increasing veg consumption in the UK and has engaged a wide range of stakeholders. And we're going to be hearing from some of those stakeholders today. Mm -hmm. This is an important topic, as we all know, diets low in fruit and vegetables are responsible for millions of avoidable deaths and lost healthy uh, years. And we also know that if we shift to a healthier diet, we can have an impact on achieving the, the sustainable development goals. So I'm excited that we've got uh, a great panel for you today. Firstly, we have Rebecca Toby. Rebecca is from the Food Foundation She's a nutritionist with a background in science, communication, and public affairs. She's going to be sharing an overview of the project, including the latest results. And apparently her favorite vegetable really is peas. Uh, we also have Dan Parker. Now, Dan spent 25 years as the chief executive and executive creative director of marketing innovation agency Sponge. And Dan knows all the tricks that the food industry have used to help us forget the health impacts of food when we are buying it. In 2015, Dan was confronted with his own health challenge. And since then, he's been using his skills and experience to support public health and to get us to eat more veg. We also have Vic Borrell from Brighton and Hove Food Partnership. That's a social enterprise inspiring and connecting people around food. And they're working on a citywide approach to increase uh, veg consumption. We also have Lauren uh, Woodley from Nomad Foods. They are known for the brand Birdseye. Lauren was the 2020 UK Registered Nutritionist of the Year and has been championing health within the food industry for the last 10 years. And last, but definitely by no means least, we have Amy Hancock. Potentially, Amy has the greatest impact of all the panelists here because she is championing health and sustainable diets within the UK's largest retailer, Tesco. So I'm looking forward to hearing more from all of these panelists, but we will kick off with Rebecca, who's gonna tell us more about the Peace Please program. Rebecca, can I hand over to you? Hi Emma, um, and it's wonderful to see so many of you here today. Um, so I won't bother introducing myself because Emma's already done a wonderful job of that. Um, but today, really looking forward to sharing some reflections um, with you all on how we've got the Peace, Peace, Please program in the UK um, successfully up and running. Um, but also we're really excited to be launching our new Peace, Please progress report um, this morning, in fact. Uh, so one of my colleagues will, will pop the link into the chat. Um, but this really summarises what Peace Please has been doing over the past uh, year or so. Um, so for those of you not familiar with Peace Please, I'll just give a very quick um, overview. Um, basically, we are a, a programme um, and we have on the face of it a very simple mission, which is we want to see everybody in the UK eating more vegetables um, and we want to make it easier for everybody to do that. 
Why? Well, very few countries globally are meeting official recommendations in terms of how much veg we should be eating. Um, but we know there are many, many health benefits to eating diets that are rich in vegetables. But as well as that, I think vegetables play a really important role in the transition towards diets that are both healthier and more sustainable. Um, so when we set up Peas Please back in 2017, um, we also knew that decades of sort of public health campaigns to get people to eat more fruit and veg um, were not working. They weren't having the impact that we know we need to, to see if people are going to change their diets. Um, so what Peas Please is all about is recognising really that it's not enough just to tell people what to do. We have to change the whole food environment and we have to make vegetables more accessible, more affordable and more appealing. So to deliver on that as our objective, and as you can see here, I think one of the things that's been really successful with Peace Please is that we are run as a partnership model. So we have partners in each of the UK's um, devolved nations. Um, you can see their logos at the bottom here. And I think that's really helped us to tap into both regional level and national level expertise and networks. Um, but in terms of what the programme does and delivers, we also try and pull on lots of levers all at once. So we've got our, our sister campaign at Veg Power, which is all about advertising and making vegetables more appealing. Um, we've got the core work stream um, that I work on at Peas Please, which is all about working with and supporting businesses to grow, serve or sell more veg, uh, depending on what they do. Um, and finally, we've got um, our sister campaign, Veg Cities, and we have our Veg Advocates programmes. And they're all about um, working with communities and with citizens um, to, to sort of galvanise change. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think another sort of top tip that I'd share with anyone interested in setting up similar programmes um, is make it fun, make it engaging, make it a bit different to the usual sort of government health, healthy eating campaigns we see. Um, so as you can see here, we, we have a lot of fun dressing up in vegetable outfits. Um, we try and make it a very positive and supportive community so that our pledges can share learnings with one another. Um, and we also try and use communications and events in sort of innovative and surprising ways. Um, so, for example, we, we often have celebrity chefs sort of speaking and involved with, with our events. Um, and I think I'd say that as we see Peas Please as being very much in movement and, and we know we need to galvanise quite significant change in the food system. I think it is really important to, to see similar programmes as, as needing to sort of build a movement. Um, but without further ado, I'm, I'm very happy to share with you all today for the first time, um, we've produced just a little summary video that looks at um, what Peace Please have achieved over the past year, um, but it also looks at where we need to go next. So I think it's important to say that even though we've had, um, you know, we've made great strides in terms of, of trying to galvanise change around vegetables, there's still a long way to go if Peace Please is really going to start having a significant impact on, on diets within the UK. Um, so uh, let's go with the video. <laughs>
Great, thank you, Rebecca, for sharing more information about Peace, Please and in the video with the updates. Some of the most exciting things I see among those results are the fact that uh, we're well on the way to a billion extra portions and that 1900 schools have been involved. And I know that one of the people who's doing a lot of the work to make sure those schools are engaged around vegetables is in fact, Dan Parker. So I'd like to hand over to Dan and he can tell us more about the veg power component of the work. Thank you very much, Emma. And thank you, Rebecca. Uh, could we stick up the slide of this, this very happy young man? Um, so Veg Power is a, an independent organization that's, that's been spun out of, the, out of the Food Foundation with a purpose to increase demand for vegetables. And uh, as Emma mentioned, my background is 25 years working in marketing agencies for big consumer brands and supermarkets and restaurants and things of that nature. And so we run Veg Power much like a marketing agency rather than a traditional NGO. And we have a product and we have a product we want the world to eat more of and our product is vegetables. We focus in two areas, which we have one part, which we're not talking about today, which is very much aimed towards uh, the adult, adults, particularly young adults, and is very much themed around seasonality and more conscious consumerism. Uh, but our flagship stuff is based around kids. And when working at kids, we have to ask a question, always, uh, Rebecca mentioned fun, with kids, it's how much fun am I having now is the, is, is the only gear that children understand. And so, what we did, we created the campaign with our partners ITV, which is now in its uh, fourth year. Could you hit the slide button, please? It's called Eat Them to Defeat Them. And what it does, is it turns the whole idea of eating vegetables upside down. It turns it into a game, a story, an adventure that the kids play with and have fun. And they know the whole thing is just a ruse to get them to eat more vegetables, but kids will play with the ruse and if adults play too and play and fun sits at the heart of trying to engage the children because it, it's really really easy to go into a school have a bit of fun and get a child to eat a piece of broccoli that's that's not that doesn't really achieve very much what achieves much is when you create long-term changes in how not only the child feels about the food but also making sure the parents and carers have the confidence to serve the food when they're concerned about conflict and they're concerned about waste. So what we're dealing here with is hearts and minds in order to make a long-term change. Now, um, uh, if you look in the chat, if you have to kind of post up, there's a, there's a four minute video for you to enjoy at your leisure later on, which shows you the campaign in action. We get tons of celebrity support and we get a, the program gazette to the kids in, 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 in schools. And the way the piece works, and let's switch to the next slide, please, which is the, uh, the happy child eating the vegetable slide, which is compulsory in any of these things, is how this works is there are three component parts. On one part, the advertising and celebrity support. We've had about 15 million pounds worth of advertising, and our celebrity support is, is pretty A-list. It's Will I Am and Anton Deck and Amanda Holden and Dem Emma Thompson and many others. What that does is it creates an environment that allows things to happen. Advertising doesn't really necessarily in itself change, make a change. What it does is it creates the environment that allows a change to happen. What we do in schools is in schools, we can create a positive peer environment that encourages kids to try something new. But habits are formed at home. So we give parents the tools to help them in terms of reward charts and sticker packs so they can repeat, reward and normalise the child's behaviour that they've tried in school. So trying something becomes normalised into the child's repertoire of food. So it's these three things working together. And um, the campaign is launching into its fourth year in February. We are going to reach a million children in the best part of 4,000 primary schools. And that is launching on the 28th of February. And uh, do follow our social feeds or our websites if you want to keep update with the campaign, how it evolves. And if you'd like to get involved, give me a shout. Thank you. Oh, we're going to play the advert now. This is our launch advert. It's a bit radical. They come from deep on the ground. Water makes them stronger. Sunlight fuels their power. And they will stop at nothing until they've taken over the world.
For years, the grown-ups have been keeping the veg invasion at bay. But they can't do it alone. They need your help, kids. You're going down, Peas. It's crunch time. Get soup. I'm helping to defeat them. Join the fight. Eat them to defeat them. Emma, does time allow for me to have one more minute? Oh, yeah, go for it, Dan. Right. So at least half the people watching are thinking, what? What a ridiculously <laughs> mad approach to take to getting children to eat vegetables. Surely it should be all jolly old farmers and, and health and happiness and freshness. What I say to them is um, if you head over to our website, which is vegpower.org.uk, there is actually a, a detailed blog about all the research and the thinking and the psychological profiling and the play that goes into doing this. And if we went back three years, it was like, well, this is really bold. But now we look at it and we know that 77% of kids say that we're making vegetables more fun, which is essential for getting them to eat it. 59% of kids and parents say that they are um, seeing their kids eating more vegetables as a result. And actually one of the most interesting stats, because a lot of survey stats can be unreliable, but this one is pretty hard fact, is that 66% of schools are reporting the fact that they have less food waste. And you think about it, food that goes into a school has two places to go. It can go into the belly and it can go into the bin. And what we're seeing is that vegetable food waste, which is the majority of food waste in schools, particularly in dining hall, we're seeing a 25% reduction in food waste in those schools where we're active because the food is going into the children's mouth rather than into the bin. Thank you for the extra minute, Emma. Brilliant, Dan. Thank you very much. And I think it's very, very inspiring to see how you're using all your creativity and marketing uh, on such an important topic. So thank you very much. Uh, and now we're going to hear about how we can take this citywide. So, uh, Vic, perhaps you can tell us about what Brighton and what you're doing with the Brighton and Hove Food Partnership. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Dan. Every time I see that little sprout on the, on the uh, dashboard, it does make me laugh. So it's, it's obviously got a power, that advert. It keeps going. Um, as Emma says, I'm from the Brighton and Hove Food Partnership, um, and we're a not-for-profit organisation that's based um, in Brighton and Hove, which, for those of you not from the UK, is on the very south coast. Um, we're quite close to London, and it's quite a mixed city. Um, we have some um, wealth and quite serious deprivation. So we're working within the context of our city. Um, Next slide, please. Um, so we have been involved in um, Peas, Please right from the start, which is when we got talking to the Food Foundation about how we could take what they were doing at a national level and really amplify it by working at a city level. So we already do work across the whole range of the food system. We do food growing, we teach people cookery, um, we do a lot of work around food poverty and food access. And so we sort of looked at the whole map and decided what could we re do to really amplify the peas please message? Um, it's gonna get popped into the chat, um, a little um, link, which it kind of summarizes a lot of what we've done because with two minutes to introduce this, um, I'm sure there's gonna be sort of bits that people are interested in that they might want to get a bit more um, information about. But I guess what we did is we sort of did a number of actions. And one of the things we've done is like loads and loads of recipe kits for families experiencing poverty. Um, which basically are largely based around um, vegetables. We have actually done some fruit ones as well, I know, radical. Um, and they include a lot of the stickers and the resources. And that was actually just really getting the kits out to people. So perhaps the first time they tried a recipe, they weren't gambling with their own money. Um, we also worked with a lot of anchor institutions. So the universities and the schools across our area, they collectively serve 2.5 million meals a month. Um, and there's a couple of um, key themes came there. One was some work with secondary schools about creating grab and go pack um, recipes because the secondary school pupils were saying how quickly they got their meal was the most important factor to them about what they ate. So if the sausage roll was the quickest cue, they were going to the sausage roll. So that became about having a sushi wrap, which has got vegetables within it. And on the primary schools, and this really ties into what Dan was saying, the school, the primary schools were having a huge problem with waste. And when we talked to the kids about it, that's because they actually preferred raw veg to some of the cooked veg. So that was actually about slightly changing the menu option about what came out based on what children were telling us. 
Um, we also looked at how we linked to Healthy Start campaign, you know, again, coming back to that question about how do people pay for the vegetables, because, you know, they are more expensive than the cheapest um, non-vegetable food. Um, we loved eat them to defeat them. We had so much fun, especially when the first campaign came out. We have school children come into our kitchen um, learning to cook. And I can remember the first day they came down and they'd seen the advert on the whatever big show it was the night before. It was then on the side of the building and they all walked into the kitchen squealing with excitement because I had a giant broccoli that they could have their photo taken with. So I guess just to say there was that really instant feeling that that was working. And then the other thing we were able to do is when the national supermarket chains were running Peas Please promotions locally, if we found out about them, we were able to do a really big flurry of local push. Because I do think that the way people experience food and their lives is they see things and then they, they see them where they live. It really helps to emphasize what um, the message is. Next slide, please. Um, so just a few quick lessons. Um, I know we're gonna come onto this in the panel. Positive message, eat more veg, easier to communicate than negative, eat less sugar. We find that time and time again, it's so much less judgmental to tell people something you'd like them to do more of, not something that they're doing wrong. Um, we had a really, really broad partnership and we just asked them, what can you do to help Brighton and Hove eat more veg? So we had food banks, schools, university, retail, food growers, and we just keep that conversation going. At different times, different people have more time and energy to put to this campaign. And that's fine. You know, it's like we don't all have to have the same amount of time at the same point. Um, using the National Reduce Resources, I've said, the films, we're always sharing it. Um, we have a really big thing about sharing and celebrating when some people do something. Because, again, I think that just keeps this kind of story in the news, really. Um, I think that our lesson about the cost of fresh veg and concern about trying a new veg being a barrier is something we have to keep coming back to. And I think we have to not dismiss the reason that sometimes people won't try veg is because it's the cost question is there. Um, and my final lesson is this whole understanding where your partners are at at that time and their motivations. So for again, the example of the school meal service, it was totally about wanting to reduce waste, which is why they got on board in the first place, not because they felt they necessarily needed to have some more veg. So I'm glad you said that, Dan, because it felt like I was right, because you've then got evidence for what I'd found at a local scale. Um, I've got a link um, that's going to be put into the chat, which is where the resources are. We do have, if you follow us on social media, we're always putting out information about what we're doing on this campaign. Thank you. Brilliant, Vic. Really great to hear what you're doing on the ground and using the resources and everything that Dan is producing and the, the team and the Peace Police team. So really great. And I totally agree with you that over the point about the fact that one of the biggest challenges is waste and that if you've got a tight budget, putting food in front of your children that you think they're not gonna eat is really, really difficult. So everything that can be done to support that and make it possible that parents can offer veg to their kids is, is fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we hear from Lauren Woodley, who's gonna be telling us more about what to, Nomad Foods are doing. Thank you, Emma. So hi, everyone. Um, so as Emma said, I am Group Nutrition Leader for Nomad Foods, which owns brands across Europe. But today I'm talking about Birdseye. So Birdseye has been around for just over 70 years. They're currently the number one frozen vegetable brand in the UK. And we have an ambition in Birdseye and in fact, in all of our brands across Europe, to get everyone eating 300 grams of vegetables by 2050. So for the UK, that's roughly 3.75 portions of veg a day, which is no small ambition. We're on a, it's gonna be a big journey and difficult journey to get there because as everyone's aware on this call, we're not there yet, we're nowhere close. Birdseye joined the Peace Please um, pledges back in 2018. And from the very beginning, we tried to approach veg consumption increase by looking at the different levers that we can really work with as a food manufacturer. So we looked at MPD, new products, developing new exciting um, mixes of vegetables and thinking about how we present our vegetables to be more appealing to consumers. We've also looked at promotions, at communications, at marketing and also seeing how we can speak to our consumers in different ways as well. 
Additionally, back in 2018, when we first joined Peace Please, we also looked at food service, which is something that as a manufacturer is quite interesting to look at because generally we focus more on the products which we sell directly to our consumers through retailers. But actually in food service, there's a great opportunity to push out recipes which have at least two portions of vegetables in which contain pulses. So we tried to look at all of those different areas which we could control as a food manufacturer. And we were the very proud, proud recipients last year of the Peas Please Pledges Champion Award, which is a real tongue twister. <laughs> um, but we, we achieved that award for our Eat, them to, uh, for our, um, Eat in Full Colour campaign, which I'm going to come on to on the next slide. Um, please, Indy. Thank you. So the Eat in Full Colour campaign also launched back in 2018. This is a campaign which up to this point has had roughly 15 million um, pounds media spend on it. And the aim of this campaign was to nudge consumers to not only eat more vegetables, but also eat a wide variety of vegetables, eat a rainbow of vegetables because of the benefits of eating a wide variety of different colored veg. This is a 360 campaign. So it involved creating new products, marketing products in a certain way, communications, promotions. And one of the key elements of the campaign has been an advert. Now, a little bit different to what Dan presented, our advert had to go with the, the kind of the cute effect. And we tried to position our vegetables as, as friendly characters. Um, so eat, the Eat in Full Colour was actually based on System 1 and System 2 theory. So Daniel Kahneman first developed the theory of fast and slow thinking. Eating vegetables is a classic system too. What I mean by that is we need to really think about whether we want to eat vegetables. It's tiresome. It's a task. We don't immediately think, well, I'm in a supermarket. I'm going to buy lots of veg, cook it and eat it. And what we wanted to do was to shift purchasing veg, but also then eating veg to be system one. It's one of those automatic behaviors which we just do and don't even need to think about. The way in which we tried to achieve this through the advertising campaign was to create a song which would act like an earworm. So we have the line, eating in full colour is the healthy thing to do. And it's, it's a very catchy song and I'm, I'm not going to sing it now, but if you want to go on YouTube, you can watch the advert and it will, it will stick in your head for a few hours. We also um, looked at the cute effect as well, which um, is a well-known uh, behavior, um, behavioral theory trait that you can do. So giving the, the characters cute faces to make them memorable. So we're trying to create memory structures for consumers. They thought about purchasing vegetables and then eating vegetables, linking it to the song. Now we've moved on to using a slightly different th uh, model of behavior change. And this model actually underpins how we've worked with Peas Please for the last couple of years and how we've developed our pledges. So this on the right hand side is the combi model. This was originally developed on behalf of the UK government using a meta analysis of 19 behaviour change models. And this effectively says that capability, opportunity and motivation ladder up to a desired behaviour and that that behaviour can become self perpetuating. So can in itself increase our capability, opportunity and motivation to do that behaviour. So we use this model when thinking about how to drive increase in veg consumption. So we work on opportunity, that's food, that's vegetables in, in this sphere. So trying to create new products. So for example, in our steam fresh range, we've tried to increase the number of interesting varieties that we, we sell. We also look at capability. So that's the, the skills, the abilities, the confidence to be able to increase vegetable consumption. There are various ways we've done that, be it speaking to school children um, through a Veg Power Challenge campaign with the National Schools Partnership, through a pop-up child-friendly restaurant where we got kids to eat a variety of vegetables, whilst also talking to parents with about top tips to increase their veg consumption for their kids, and also motivation. And motivation has been through telling people the benefits of vegetables, but also actually through promotions as well. So making it financially motivating to be, to be purchasing vegetables. These have laddered up to the desired behavior. We have seen an increase in vegetable consumption. The proxy that we use has to be the sales that we see from vegetables. But I think a really nice stat to just share, kind of to end my little section here would be that in Steam Fresh, which is our frozen mixed veg ranges we sell, We've seen an increase in sales of more than 50% since 2017. So joining the Peas Please Pledge, thinking about how we build opportunity, capability and motivation for people across the UK to increase vegetables has actually translated to an increase in, in 23 million portions of vegetables being sold this year versus 2017. Um, so we're, we're some way on the journey to increasing veg consumption. Okay, thanks, Emma. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you very much, Lauren. And it's a question that many people ask, can businesses who are often seen as the problem really be part of the solution? And I think that you are showing that they definitely can. And congratulations on your, I almost don't dare say it, please, please, <laughs> pledges award. Fantastic. And ca carrying on um, on the theme of what businesses can do, I'd like to hand over to Amy from Tesco, who can tell us more about what they are doing. But thank you very much, Lauren. Brilliant. Thank you, Emma. Hi. Um, as Emma said, I'm Amy. I work at Tesco in health and sustainable diets. And um, one of the key parts of my job is to work with the Peace Please team and the Food Foundation on our Tesco Peace Please pledges. Um, but before I talk to you today about those and, and how we work together, I'm really pleased to share with you a video that we've recorded recently with the Food Foundation and um, their veg advocates on Peace Please. So, Indu, if you wouldn't mind playing the video, please. Peas. Peas. We're here today in Tesco's HQ, and we've got two of our veg advocates coming along today. And what's really exciting is that Tesco's are letting us into their test kitchens and really see uh, what Tesco's are doing with their Peas Please Pledge. This is our meat and veg mince. Um, mm -hmm. As you can see, it looks like normal mince. Um, we've got a mixture here of butternut squash, carrot, and okay. onion in the actual product. So this is already minced in, <gasps> so you get a really similar texture. What does it take to become a veg advocate? Like, what, what is a day in the life of you really like? Vegetables are kind of like the unsung heroes. Mm -hmm. So I always try to think about how can I take everyday vegetables and make it into something delicious that I'm going to get more of my five a day, but at the same time have really more fun with it. I think for me it's important, if we're talking str strategic, to be involved with campaigns that are national about trying to bring together, because loads of people are doing interesting stuff about vegetables, aren't they? Yeah. It's about seeing where all that's going and how we can all be more than the sum of our parts. Affordable, healthy and sustainable food is really important at Tesco and earlier this year we refreshed our public commitments as a business. We've committed to continue our journey on reformulation to make our product recipes healthier. We do this by not only removing the bad stuff, so the nutrients of concern, sugar, saturated fat and salt, but also increasing the good stuff, both fibre and fruit and veg and that's really where Peas Please comes into play. Our veg advocates are 180 people from all across the UK. They're all super passionate about helping to make it easier for us all to eat more veg. And they actually have a really important role to play because what they're doing is feeding their own lived experiences of accessing and affording veg into our work with businesses and government. So by working together, we hope we can really make a difference and, and change the food environment for the better. So Jamie, what makes you passionate about Peas Please? I think in general, as a business, we're super passionate about helping the nation make healthier choices um, and also increasing their veg intake. And Peas Please is obviously a way that we can help the nation. Peas. 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 We are peas. Super. Thanks, Indy. Um, and I hope you enjoyed that. And I, I just want to reflect on it and say we're really proud to, to work with the Food Foundation and the Veg Advocates. And it's a great video showing how we will work together internally and to give a bit of insight on what um, those very special veg advocates do. And before I kind of dive into a bit more detail on how we uh, work together with Peas Please, I just wanted to take a few moments to set the scene a bit on health at Tesco. And like I said in the video, you know, we really believe that affordable, healthy and sustainable food should be available to all. And what we know is that 70% of our customers want retailers to help them eat more healthily and more sustainably. Eating well is just so important. It improves educational chances, it improves mental well-being, and can also help prevent chronic, uh, chronic health conditions later in life. So obviously it's really important for us as a business to help make changes in this space. And one really important factor in eating more healthily, as we all know, is uh, getting enough uh, vegetables and fruit in our diets. And we know that some of our customers can really struggle to hit their recommended five portions of fruit and veg a day, every day. So we're really proud to partner with the Food Foundation and Peas Please um, to help everybody in Britain eat a bit more veg. 
Please, please fit so well into our wider health and sustainable diet strategy and support on our uh, market leading commitments that, that you heard in the video, including that 65% healthy sales um, target that we've set. And ultimately what our goal is, is to make Tesco the easier place for customers to shop for affordable, healthy and sustainable food. So we've been part of Peace Please for a number of years now, and I'm gonna spend the next few minutes talking mostly about our pledges and their evolution and what we've learned as Tesco uh, from our work in this space. Pledges are obviously what underpins um, PSP's progress and we're really pleased to have refreshed ours and, and taken them to sort of the next level earlier this year. And we really focus in on products and promotions which really are both massive opportunities for a retailer in terms of increasing veg. So, our first new pledge that we've committed to is an evolution of one of our original pledges on ready meals. So earlier this year, we pledged to increase the proportion of our own brand ready meal range, which contains a portion of um, five a day. And we're gonna increase that to 66% of the range containing one of your five a day, or at least one of your five a day. And that's up from our baseline of 26% in 2018. And up again from our 2020 position of 50% of the range uh, hitting one of five a day. So obviously it's a really stretching target. We're really challenging ourselves uh, in this area. And I'm gonna to talk to you now about the two main ways in which we deliver this. So firstly, new product development, um, where we launch innovative new products which contain loads of lovely vegetables, um, such as our beautifully balanced range, which you might've seen a glimpse of in um, the video where each meal in that range of ready meals contains at least two of your five a day, it has no red front of pack traffic lights. So we're really looking at holistic health. Um, and we've currently refreshed the range so that there are loads of delicious new products in there to, to try. And the second way we're gonna increase the proportion of ready meals containing one of five a day is through reformulation. And here, we've had a really long journey on reformulation at Tesco and we focus a lot on taking out um, those kind of negative nutrients. And this is a really positive uh, side of reformulation where we're taking our existing products, looking at their recipes and adding more veg to them. So they meet at least the, rec uh, the required 80 grams of, of veg to hit one of five a day, but also um, really importantly, maintaining the taste and quality that we know is so important to customers and that they expect from our products. Our second renewed pledge is to expand our pick of the crop special offers on seasonal vegetables and fruits in our express stores. And there's a bit of a backstory to, to this pledge. And it's basically a, we've taken the learnings from the successes of some trials we ran as co-chairs of the Consumer Goods Forum's Collaboration for Healthier Lives work. And in the trials, we took a few stores in London and put in those stores, pick of the crop special offers, um, which were known as Fresh 3 at the time, they've had a bit of a rebrand, um, but basically what they are are three great offers on seasonal vegetables and fruits, which change every two weeks so customers can get a really good variety of new produce to add to their diets. And following the success of the um, CGF, or Collaboration for Healthier Lives trial, we actually rolled the deals out to 400 stores nationwide. And what we've done now for Peace Please is set ourselves the challenge of rolling this out, doubling its presence in stores by rolling out to, in total, 800 stores nationwide. So as you can see, we've got um, two really stretching targets here. And something that's really important in both of those um, that underpins our pledges is data and I cannot express enough the importance of having really good quality data, both for informing your plans and setting targets and pledges and understanding how you're gonna deliver those, but also for reporting on progress. And one of the things we've done to help us on our journey with Please Please is we've had to really understand our product composition so that we can calculate accurately the number of portions of um, vegetables that we're selling through our pledges. And this can be a lot, lot trickier in composite products like ready meals where you've got loads of different ingredients in there. And we've had to really take the time to understand um, 
what proportion of those are vegetables versus other ingredients. And we work really closely with our data teams and our expert company nutritionists in this space to build a bespoke reporting tool for, for calculating out, you know, in each ready meal, how many grams of vegetables are there? How many of those ready meals do we sell in a year? What does that uh, equate to in portions of, of veg? So that we can report really robustly um, in our Please Please Pledge reporting. And as well as this, we've kind of taken it a step further and we're looking at contextualizing data so that we can see how that number of portions, uh, which last year was 168 million portions through, through ready meals, how that sits within our total portions of ready, uh, of fruit and veg that we sell um, as a known brand business, which is amazing. And we're really looking forward to sharing that data um, for our next update and, and utilizing those tools we've built. So that's everything um, from me for now. I'm really looking forward to taking any questions you have and discussing anything in more detail um, when we get to the panel session. Brilliant, thank you very much, Amy. It's uh, very exciting to hear what Tesco is doing. And I think that there's two points that I think are, are very interesting. One is that you're um, working on targets for express stores. I know that it sometimes is harder to work on targets for the smaller stores. So great that you're doing that. And I'm a big fan of the work that you do on data because I think that all food businesses would benefit by sharing more information and data. And also it's a great benefit for the rest of, of the society to know what food businesses are doing. So congratulations on your data work. Um, we will keep an eye on the chat. So if there are questions, then put them in the chat. Uh, and we've got just over 15 minutes. So what I'd like to do now is ask each of the panelists if they can share one lesson that they have learned or a useful resource um, from their time. Actually, I'd like to start with Dan. So uh, Dan, if we can put, make sure that Dan is visible. Dan, can you share what's your most important lesson learned from everything you've done in uh, Veg Power? And do you have any particular tip that you want to share with us? I would say that the uh, lesson I would share is that people that don't buy Well, I don't hear you brilliantly, Dan. Maybe you can... Sorry. The lesson I would share is that people don't buy health, they buy happiness. And with children, um, happiness is quite simple. It's about how much fun I have now. With adults, happiness is a slightly more complicated idea. But if we try and persuade people they should um, eat more veg because it's going to be beneficial for their health. It just doesn't work. It's never worked. It's failed again and again and again. What we've got to do is vegetables have an image problem, right? And we need to tackle that image problems by, you know, as birds are being so very nice with their campaign, they take a different approach to us, but essentially they're heading in the same direction. It's about making veg fun, right? And I think fun is even more important than taste. Taste is a prerequisite. To be considered food, you need to taste good, right? Tasting good does not get you a license to be eaten. You have to be more than that. The most important thing is to make it exciting and aspirational and engaging for the people in it. That's what I would say. Brilliant. Thank you, Dan. And um, Vic, can I ask the same question to you? You shared some of your lessons learned, but what would be the main lesson learned? And is there any tip that you'd like to share with us? Um, I think that... Um, my lesson is actually a little bit about because we're trying to work with loads and loads of different players. So we were working with retailers, we were working with producers, we we're working with schools and actually having the common like peas, please, even though nobody can say it. And I have to say the peas, please, pleasure and the peas, please, pleasure priorities or whatever it is, gets every single person into a terrible tongue twister. Right. But actually whether I'm talking to a school or whether I'm talking to it, is it oh, it's part peace, please. And the, the fact that that gave us a shorthand to what we were talking about has actually been really helpful. So I guess, I think the thing is, is that almost I'd say to everybody, my top tip is keep talking about it, keep talking about it. Cause then everybody else knows that they're part of something bigger, whether they're a tiny food growing project or the Tesco's they're all part of the same program. And that's really exciting. Brilliant. I also see that there's this question specifically for you, Vic. So I'll ask it while you're here, which is, um, what is the most, in your opinion, what is the most important local lever for increasing veg consumption? Um, I would have actually said that one of the most important things about the, the quantity, you know, the, the big hitters was actually working with procurement, working with the large caterers, the universities, because actually I think the idea of the millions of meals you can hit 
in by just changing what gets served in schools, hospitals or whatever. Um, so I think that is a really, really important driver, but it, it doesn't happen on its own. And so, again, I come back to this whole thing about this, this actually having a story that works locally. OK, we took all the characters that, you know, had been produced for Veg Power and we actually put them on Brighton Pier or we put them by the I360. Right. We made it feel like it was a really local campaign. I know Hull did exactly the same. You know, that idea of take the campaign and make it work for your place. I think is probably um, also really important. Brilliant, fantastic. Yeah, the localization of what, yeah, taking the resources, not reinventing the wheel, but just running with what there is, is definitely yeah, fantastic. Um, Lauren, what is your uh, most important lesson learned from everything you've done in recent years? And do you have a tip for the? Yes, absolutely. So most important lesson learned has actually been about putting structure into what we do. So the combi model, honestly, for us and, and for me particularly, it was a game changer. I think there are loads of things you can do with vegetables and it's a lovely category to work on as a nutritionist. It makes a nice change, but you can have a thousand different ideas and it's very difficult to work out how you actually prioritize ideas and how you put together a coherent strategy. And so for me, the lesson learned would be to actually look to behavior change models. Increasing vegetable consumption is a significant behavior change. I think the last couple of years have shown that we're all capable of quite significant behavior change when needed. Um, so just actually putting the ideas into a structure it leads to a better overall outcome. That would be my lesson learned. And the top tip would be for anyone who maybe works in the kind of retail and manufacturer world would be talk to kids. This is one of the very few categories where we're not just talking to providers or what we call gatekeepers. We can responsibly talk to children and get them really excited about vegetables. For the majority of food um, categories, you wouldn't talk to children. It wouldn't feel responsible with veg. It's absolutely the time to talk to kids. So embracing inner child, thinking what would have made you excited about veg, to what would have been fun about vegetables when you were younger and take that and apply it to how you then create communications for children. Um, that would be the top tip. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Lauren. And it's great to see that one of the changes I think we've seen in recent years, which all of you are doing, is that we're really taking the knowledge, the science, the research, and we're using it on veg. And we used to use that on other areas, and now we're really applying it where we should apply it. So that's fantastic to see. Amy, you've shared a lot about Tesco, but what are your lessons learned? And what would your tip be for others uh, to be, who are working in this area? So I'm going to touch back on reformulation because it is such an important part of getting more veg into products kind of in a health by stealth kind of way. Um, and my tip would be, or my lesson learned and tip would be, basically you can't just knee jerk and completely change a product overnight without taking customers on a journey. And we're really lucky at Tesco because we've got a team of chefs and product developers who we can work really closely with to reformulate and gradually tweak recipes over time, maintaining their taste and quality and also what customers expect from that product because you can't just take, for example, probably a bad example, but a carbonara and stick loads of Brussels sprouts in it. That just wouldn't work for, for customers. So taking customers on that journey with reformulation getting them used to a slightly different type of product, maintaining that taste and quality is, is so important. And to be honest, we've learned it in the past in the hard way where you formulate a product, it's not quite right and customers really do tell you. Um, so that would be my uh, lesson learned, but also my tip is that step-by-step -step approach to reformulation and adding in more veg. Brilliant. And I see we've got a couple of questions for you. I do know that Tesco has been involved in, in um, uh, your data analysis work has been going on for years, but there is a question about whether the share action resolution was, a, was an extra trigger for you around reporting what you think and what you think about mandatory reporting targets uh, that are, there's more and more discussion, National Food Strategy talks about that. So you use data internally, but you also re report externally the role of share action for you and your thoughts on mandatory data reporting on health? So uh, transparency is really important um, to us and Emma you touched on it before I think in your um, kind of follow on from um, my little speech um, and we, now is a really good time to start being more transparent. WWF have recently done a webinar which we spoke at on how we're sharing more data 
and this year we have been the first retailer in the UK to publish our percentage of protein in own brand products from um, meat and egg versus plant versus fish sources. So it is growing and it is absolutely the right time to, to share more and more. Um, in terms of the share action response, it's absolutely provided us with a, a great opportunity to, to share more. Um, and we have been able to refresh our, our commitments and we have, um, you know, gone public on these with probably the, the market lead, the most market leading um, commitments on, on health in the industry. And I do think mandatory reporting is, you know, it's an ongoing conversation. I do think we'll see more and more people coming to the, to the table with um, more transparency in their businesses. Brilliant. And that's certainly what uh, we'll hope to see, I think. Um, we've also seen, uh, we've also got a, a question about students. Uh, Vic gave an answer, but I don't know if anyone else if you want to answer about how students could get more involved in uh, uh, increasing veg consumption, plants-based uh, consumption. Can I add to Vic's point on that? Is we did, a fair, we did a fair amount of research recently about what part, people who are choosing more plant-based diet are choosing to eat. And the answer is that people who are choosing a plant-based diet are not choosing more plants. What they're doing is buying a lot of heavily marketed protein shapes mm. and meals and food that has a worse environmental footprint and worse nutritional pattern than the stuff they're eating before. And there is a wind blowing that's incredibly powerful through our society that is a sector we need to put our sail into that wind. How do we turn all that desire for a more conscious consumer into people actually eating a better diet rather than the worst diet. And we are very, very firmly losing at this point in time. And we need to address that, I think, collectively with some urgency. I think that's an excellent point, Dan. I think that is a huge risk that we all know that you can have a very unhealthy plant-based diet if you don't make the right choices. So it's absolutely key that we help people shift to a plant-based diet with an increase in veg and an increase in the right foods and not in an increase in highly processed or unhealthy uh, veg alternatives, which also exist, of course. Thank you for that. And then we're, we have another few minutes. So last but not least, Rebecca, is there any particular lesson learned? You've been uh, working heavily on peas, please. Is there something that you would like to share with us as the last yeah, comment? Um, I, think, I think my main learning probably builds actually on, on some of, of what both Amy and Lauren have been saying. I think for us, we found, so as you probably saw from the video, we've made great strides in terms of increasing our sort of cumulative portion figure that comes, comes through all the hard work of all our, our pledges. So this year we've hit 636 million cumulative portions. Um, so that's extra veg on plates and in shopping baskets since Peace Please launched. Um, and that's almost 300% higher than the previous year. Um, and predominantly that's come about because we've made progress um, in terms of the commitments that businesses are making to the program being much smarter, so more specific, more measurable, being sort of time bound and having sort of discrete targets for, for which businesses are sort of working against to achieve. And I think that touches on, on um, how important transparency is um, and it just makes it a lot easier to see where we're going and what else we need to be doing, um, but also putting a bit of structure in place around some of the pledges because as, as Lauren was saying, I mean, there's loads we could be doing and, and probably loads we should be doing. Um, but I think it's really helped us to see how much further we need to go and where we've, where we've come from by having those sort of smarter targets um, in, in place. Brilliant. And actually on, on targets, when I worked at Arhold, I remember that in the 2010, we were setting our new targets for, the, for five years, so 2010 to 2015. And we actually set one target. It was around the supply chain, but we set it for 2012. And actually, both me and my boss at the time, we knew we wouldn't, we knew we couldn't eat it. We knew it. But we said that if we set the target for 2015, we knew the businesses wouldn't move. So sometimes I would like to encourage businesses to consider setting unachievable targets because there's power in having a target, even if you know you can't meet it. Um, and we did actually uh, meet the targets in the end, but we didn't meet them in 2012. Yeah, I would absolutely second that. I mean, at Peace Please, we're big fans of setting ourselves very ambitious targets. 
because yeah as you say you know aim high hope to reach the sky you know you might end up a bit further than you thought you would even if you don't meet the target yeah that's exactly it and yeah of course make sure that you really can measure them and that's what's great about the work that uh, the partners are doing around peace please I see that we have four more minutes. So are there any other comments that anybody would like to share before we close up? And are there any more questions? Set them in the chat. Let me see. Well, if, if you'd like to know more about Peace, please, then do contact uh, the team. I think that the information is also going to be shared in the chat, how you can get in touch with Peace, please. Um, see that in a second. Uh, the recording will also be shared. So if you missed any pieces, then do uh, look back. And um, yeah, I think uh, everybody is doing fantastic work. That's one other th uh, thought I had while Lauren was speaking, actually, I'm excited by their goal of 300 grams uh, vegetables for uh, the UK, because I know that in the Netherlands, we have a goal, and it's our official goal, that people should eat 250 grams of vegetables. Now, when that goal was first set, the actual consumption was 127 grams. So that was just under half. And I know that we're close to about 140 grams. Uh, so I'm afraid there's a very long way to go. But this is another target where there's power in having a far reaching target. And then yeah. hopefully we will meet it. Absolutely. That's probably some human psychology kicks in, doesn't it? Five a day taught the world that three was probably enough. Yeah, exactly. So actually, we should have said eight a day. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. You. No, no, Lauren, sorry, you were. Yeah, no, it was just to say yeah, the 300 grams a day. I think the uh, the planetary health um, diet that was developed by the Atlantic Commission that was that was really inspiring for us, kind of at a company level, to be honest. And that's where we adopt the 300 grams from. And it's kind of Rebecca's point around having kind of targets that you can hit 300 grams a day by 2050. But there were discussions of, well, how do you meet that a 2050 target? Who knows who will be in the organization at that point? So it is also about setting ourselves then targets for every couple of years of where we want to get to. So ideally, we're going to spring over the 300 grams a day, but it's yeah, it, it's a long journey to get there. But I do think, I mean, already the uh, the report that's been released today by Peas Please, the number of additional portions that are in people's baskets on their plates, it's really positive. I think we are we are seeing a shift, which we haven't seen for a long time. So I personally feel optimistic that we are going to get close to it and hopefully overshoot it. <laughs> Absolutely, Lauren, I, and I completely agree with you. And I think that that's the that's the great thing about setting targets. They can be difficult, but. Uh, Sometimes you can actually overshoot them. So let's hope that we do. I see that there's one last question from Eve about working with the sustainable development goals. And uh, yeah, definitely. I think all of you, all of the organizations here are also involved in the sustainable, de sustainable development goals. And obviously increasing veg consumption is an important part of, of meeting the sustainable development goals. Yeah, and just if I may add as well as a, as a sort of passing shot, um, we're very happy to answer any questions. I know we've got some sort of international representatives on the line, but if you wanted to pick up with Peace Please afterwards, or if you're thinking of running similar programmes in your own countries, yeah, do just feel free to reach out because we'd really like to see more of this happening everywhere. <laughs> Uh, one second, there's one, uh, are all these companies linked to Peace Please and your charity? Yeah, so the Food Foundation is the UK charity, Peace Please is the programme, and all the organisations make pledges to Peace Please, uh, and there are 105 pledges, I believe, if I <laughs> remember rightly from the current report, which you can look. So download the report. Thank you very much to Dan, Vic, Lauren, Amy, and to Rebecca, and uh, we hope you've enjoyed this session. Thanks very much.